Muy buenos días. Good morning. I open hearing number 10 of the ordinary period of session of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights titled The Situation of Judicial Independence in El Salvador, requested by civil society organizations. My name is Julissa Amantilla. I'm the president of the commission and also a rapporteur for El Salvador, and I'm here with other commissioners, Carlos Bernal, Joel Hernández. Uh, I uh, greet the uh, different special rapporteurs here present today, and I want to start by respectfully greeting and thanking the presence of the representation of the state and the representatives of the civil society. I will explain some things regarding methodology. First of all, how we will be distributing the time. First of all, we will have a 20 minute participation by the civil society, then the state, and then the Com Inter-American Commission will also intervene for 20 minutes with comments and questions. Then we'll have a second round of 12 minutes each from the civil society and the state. Let me remind you that if at any uh, intervention you don't use all your time, that time can be accumulated for the end. In that sense, we have a clock, a digital tool to measure time. And this hearing has a simultaneous interpretation and closed captioning. This is being streamed live by webcast and the recording is at the disposal of uh, any person at the commission's YouTube channel. and. So I open the floor for the civil society participation. You will have 20 minutes for your intervention. Please introduce yourselves. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, commissioners, special rapporteurs, and officials of the executive secretariat. My name is Ursula Intacoche, and on behalf of TPLF and other requesting organizations, I would like to thank you for this space to discuss the situation of judicial independence in El Salvador. I would like to highlight two important points. First is that the events that will be presented occurred after the on-site visit, in loco visit in early 2019, and are not included in the country report published in November 2021. However, due to their seriousness, this event altered the human rights situation in El Salvador. Uh, secondly, because of the seriousness of these facts and their impact on several pillars of democracy that are defined in the Inter-American Democratic Charter, such as the exercise of power in accordance with the law, the principle of separation and dependence of public powers and the respect of public of human rights, we consider the Commission must approach the situation of judicial independence in El Salvador as relay, in relation with the American Convention on Human Rights and also with the commitment to promote the defense of democracy established in Article 1 of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. In its uh, report, Corruption and Human Rights, Re and Human Rights the Commission noted that the vi vital validity of rights and freedoms in the democratic system requires a legal institutional order in which laws prevail over the will of the rulers and individuals and in which there is effective judicial control of the constitutionality and legally legality of acts of public power that order does not exist anymore or is being almost completely eliminated in El Salvador through a strategy of dismantling and co-optation of the justice system by the political power. As we will de develop below and is clearly shown on the slide we are projecting, this strategy has had several stages that obey a clear logic and neutralizing logic to neutralize the capacity of the justice system to control and exercise power outside of the law and protect the rights and freedom of citizens. These are the following stages, promoting hostile narrative towards justice to capture the high courts of the Attorney General's office, capture vertically the institutional framework and a final stage, which we are currently in, that aims to consolidate these changes on a permanent basis through a constitutional reform in the area of justice. I will begin by referring to the first stage. Since the beginning of his mandate, but even since his presidential campaign, President Bukele has used a privileged platform of public and political discourse to attack justice by proposing an international anti-corruption mechanism which presupposes the weakness and incapacity of national institutions, but also against specific decisions adopted especially by the Constitutional Chamber 
and the Attorney General's office back, back then. We cannot reproduce the number of tweets in which he accuses them of being corrupt enemies of the people or blames them for the deaths of citizens produced in the context of the pandemic. What is certain is that the construction of this narrative, a perfect scenario was created to justify the next steps. Next, I will give the floor to my colleague, Senia Hernandez of the DTJ Foundation, who will speak about the following, the capture of the High Courts, Constitutional Chamber of the Constitutional Chamber and the Supreme Court of Justice. Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners. On May the 1st, 2021, the new deputies of the 2021-2024 legislature members took office with a majority of the ruling parties. As the first act, they unconstitutionally and arbitrarily removed the magistrates of the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court and their alternates, and they directly appointed their replacements. The removal was carried out without prior process. There was no communication of their charges, no exercise of the right of defense, and no debate in the plenary se session in contravention of all international standards that require due guarantees for the removal of justice operators from office. The constitution was violated, which expressly states that dismissal is only possible for specific causes previously established by law. Neither in the correspondence nor the approved degree is any cause identified. During the pandemic, President Bukele celebrated this decision. The directment appointment of the replacement was also unconstitutional for two reasons. The selection procedure provided for in, for in the Constitution was not followed, and there was no evaluation of the minimum requirements for the opposition within the Assembly itself. The legitimate Constitutional Chamber issued a mandate that same night declaring both decisions unconstitutional, but it was not followed. On the contrary, the police used force to enter the offices of the chambers, Insta install the new magistrates and prevent the entry of those who had been removed. The capture also extended to the entire Supreme Court. At the time of these events, a selection process was already underway to replace five other judges whose terms had expired. The assembly, after receiving a list of selected candidates, summoned them for interviews in which they did not allow the presence of the civil society, nor did it evaluate their merits. Rather, the deputies inquired whether or not the candidates coincided with the government line of the party Nuevas Ideas. This five appointed, uh, added to the five appointed appointments from the Constitutional Chamber, added to 10 of the 15 Supreme Court justices. Despite the fact that the constitution prohibits the assembly from appointing more than one third of the court, the impacts of this capture of the high court has been evident. Not only weeks later, the constitutional chamber issued an, a sentence enabling immediate presidential re-election. Despite the fact that there, had, there are five constitutional articles that prohibit this. And this prohibition has been constant in all constitutions that have existed, existed in more than 200 years of Republican life. Recent research shows other less visible impacts, jurisprudential changes that make it more difficult to question the approval of law or that deny the right of citizens to question irregular appointments of high officials, arguing that they are a zone exempt from constitutional control. The same investigation shows the exponential increase in the number of lawsuits rejected, rejected without merit, even when several judges have participated in their resolution of cases where they were impeded because they themselves signed the challenged act or because they had their direct interest in matter. I uh, give the floor to my colleague, Saira Navas de Cristal, who will speak about the institutional capture of the judicial branch. 
Good morning. On August 31st, 2021, the Legislative Assembly approved Decree 144 of Reforms to the Judicial Career Law, which determined the cessation of function of magistrates and judges upon reaching 60 years of age or 30 years of service, with the exceptions of the magistrates of the Supreme Court, as well as the creation of an availability regime to continue in office, but without guarantees of stability for those who so decide, and empower the court to order the transfer of judicial officials without prior procedure or consent. It was argued that this was a purge for co corruption. The court established as a requirement for granting bonuses to the, to the judges removed, to the judges that would resign. So this is a result of coercion, which would qualify as a violation of the guarantee against extern external pressure. On September 22, 2021, the Family Chamber of San Miguel ordered the suspension of the application of Decree 144 for contradicting the Inter-American Convention for the Protection of Human Rights of Older pe Persons. However, disobeying the court order on September 26 and October the 14th, the court appointed 98 judges and magistrates. In addition, it endorsed the continuity of 115 of them under availability regime, and 34 of them were dismissed without compensation or bonus. Many affected persons still do not have the legally required time or service to be entitled to a pension. In violation of the law on access to public information, the Supreme Court has refused to make public the lists of judges and magistrates appointed, dismissed and transferred, arguing it could pose a risk to the security and physical integrity. Decree 144 and the court's decision violate the competencies of the National Council of Judiciary established in Article 187 of the Constitution, which establishes that this body is empowered to propose candidates for the position of magistra magistrates and judges. It attacks judicial independence and the system of democratic controls. The Commission has heard cases of judges and magistrates affected by the application of this reform. Which, which show the violation, among others, of the right to equality and non-discrimination, guarantees of due, due process for the judges, and also the rights to truth, judicial protection, and the guarantee of a natural judge have also been violated in cases of serious human rights, such as the massacre of El Mosote and the surrounding areas. Since November 2021, the Inter-American Court expressed its deep concern about the negative impacts of this degree. Since it caused determination in the exercise of the function of the criminal judge in charge with the consequent delay that may be caused in the conclusion of the stage of the provinces by the fact that a new judge has been appointed to the position, given the complexity and volume of the case file. The reform has served for the instrumentalization of the judicial body. Several judges have been transferred to the interior of the country for their attachment and defense of judicial independence, among them Judge Antonio Duran, Magistrates Carlos Sanchez, Samuel Lizama, and Magistrate Cecia Romero. Among other effects is the manipulation of the use Puniendi, the arbitra arbitrary transfer of the judge by not admitting the complaint filed by a deputy of the ruling party, and another judge who was transferred a week after granting precautionary measures to substitute provisional detention to the former Ministry of Public Security of the previous government. The guilds of judges and legal professionals have been manipulated to discredit and prosecute their colleagues for demanding an end to interference in the judiciary. In the context of the capture of the judicial body, the situations faced by Judge Jorge Guzman and Antonio Duran are exemplary, and their testimonies are presented below. Good morning, honorable commissioners. Within the facts perpetrated, we would like to underscore to the impunity conditions, vulnerability conditions that they did not accept the 24 month bonus and the situation of inavailability because it's uh, principals lose their stability in their positions so they can be moved anytime if their decisions are not agreeable for the people 
And they have also operated to de-articulate several timbers such as the environmental and uh, commercial tenders and they have been passed to another chambers where they do not bother the regime. Those removals have been again because of the actions against the regime. So we articulating the judicial bodies, they can manipulate the legal processes in detriment to the population that they have the right to have uh, independent judges. I will now give the floor to Winston Sandoval. Sorry. Honorable commissions, in the name of the judges of El Salvador, I would like to express my concern due to the deterioration of democracy and the Republican system, the separation of powers. And we would like to express our frustration because we believe that those uh, interventions could have been the, uh, stopped with a uh, timely intervention of the commission, avoiding the intervention of the judicial body. Since we had access to this commission until now, there were several facts. The Supreme Court was uh, intervene. There were judges uh, of 60 years that have been uh, dismissed. We have, uh, there have been arbitrary removals. There are appointment of judges without a selection process. Fiscalization by the Supreme Court of rulings that favor or affect opposing parties affecting judicial independence. Facing this context and to avoid major impacts, we request this commission to reconsider the possibility of uh, granting precautionary measures, taking into consideration the Inter-American Convention for the Protection of the Early Second to request El Salvador to re repeal the 144 degree and to uh, reincorporate the judges. Now, Wilson Sandoval from Funda will speak about the capture of the attorneys general. Good morning. In the same session of May 1st, Raul Melara, the then attorney general of the Republic, was removed from office on that day. The Legislative Assembly, from that day, removed the attorney general of the Republic with the both of the ruling parties, ideas, and other parties in a summary manner, in clear contradiction of the Constitution of the Republic, replacing him on the spot with the current attorney general of the Republic, who was elected in the summer last year for the new term, will combine with international law and the rules of the law, especially in the warranties of independence and impartiality, especially in respect to verifying the political parties and independence, leading to an irregularity of the process. In Salgado took office in May last year, different Units have been dismantled within the Attorney General Office, directed by Germán Arriaza. At that time, now excited for fear of reprisals, he was transferred to another unit in May when the current prosecution took office. In the same month, the head of the UA, Raquel Gómez, was removed from her position without further information being made public. Another unit that was dismantled after the late questioning is a special and smart those facilities were raided by the Attorney General Office in January of this year. Some of the prosecutors who belong to this group and who work on corruption cases investigated by the International Commission against the Indian El Salvador are also in exile for fear of reprisal. Another aspect to be considered is the instrumentalization of political power over the prosecutor's office to criminalize human rights defenders. An example of this is a raid carried out by prosecutors to organizations such as Las Medias, a movement with extensive experience working to the empowerment of women at the national level, as well as other secular organizations working in the promotion of defense of human rights. This criminalization could be aggravated with the approval of the draft deal of the foreign law currently being debated in the Assembly, which would give greater powers to the Attorney General Office to criminalize 
are many prosecutes in a discretionary manner other organizations that are targets of attack by the government for the mere fact of dissent, I defer to Alejandra Malavela from the Center of Justice and International Laws, the Council, as to present our petitions. In view of the foregoing, we request the Honorable Commission the following. Following the situation of threats to judicial independence, and particularly the risk faced by justice and judges and justice is urgent in the state to immediately and permanently cease the tragedies of harassment, prosecution, uh, judicial harassment reminding them of their duty to warranty the independent exercise of jurisdictional function. I urge the states to not to use internal transfer of administrative punitive law to limit jurisdictional action, as well as to refrain from maliciously using criminal law against government critics. In view of the accelerated worsening of the risk situation of justice operation, operators and in order to avoid irreparable damage to life, integrity and judicial independence, urgently and as a priority process, the protection measures required. Given the affectations to judicial independence and human rights are a consequence of a structural problem, we request per seldom treatment to petitions filed on justice operators. In the same sense, we would not, do not give special concessions of deadline to the state to delay the processes, conduct a working visit by the country rapporteur and the human rights defenders and justice op operator rapporteur to expand and update information gathered after the on-site visit to the country and issue new recommendations in this area to the state make the situation of the judicial independence in El Salvador visible in the end of session communique and finally require the state to warranty the safety and integrity of all persons who have participated in this hearing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the representatives of the civil society for the due management of time. I would give the floor to the state for 20 minutes now. Your commissioners, ratings from the state of El Salvador. And to the petitioners of this hearing, we would like to greet the commissioner, Julissa Mantisha, who is also the country rapporteur. And we wish success to the new executive committee of the, the board of the commission. This topic is of essence for the El Salvador. The rep state representation for this hearing here, we have the delegate of the presidency of the Supreme Court of Justice of our country, the General Prosecutor's Office, the Ministry of Justice, and of these foreign office. I would like to introduce our delegation, Tatiana Alceda, advisor, juridical advisor for the Presidency of the Republic, Gilberto Ernesto Evalázquez, from the Secretary of the Supreme Court, Vladimir Montejo, Director of Planning of the Supreme Court of Justice. Néstor Gurman, Director of uh, Legal Instruction. Jaime Rivera, all of them from the representatives of the state. Arispides. Both from the Ministry of Security, we also have Commissioner Neri Tayan Mayam, who is the chief of uh, the Department of International Cases of Human Rights, and Tania Camila Rosa, both from the Ministry of Foreign Relations. We have already heard what was expressed by the representatives. We would uh, like the commission to get to know some of the presidents of the justice administration system of our country. I am sure that the commission knows our history and the challenges we face that have led the 
situation of the sessions of the country and the different re mechanisms of uh, defense, they have observed a judicial inefficient system who grant impunity and the the state has received multiple recommendations to reform this court for the protection of human rights i would now give the floor to the representatives of the supreme court representatives good morning commissioners I'm sorry, but the mic, the mic is not working properly. In representation of the Supreme Court Justice, I would like to express some considerations by the petitioners. I would like to emphasize that there is awareness on the effective protection of human rights and the justice administration system of our country is essential we see the need to reform the judicial system in El Salvador and they contemplated some constitutional ways and the effective mechanisms of human rights warranty within the, this framework and within the framework of the reform through decree 144 from issued in August 2021, I would like to refer to the fact that such body did not reply to the actual reality, not only to warranty the access of a timely service, but also for the actions that the Supreme Court of Justice has tried to implement in order to keep that body efficient. The reform through the uh, judicial career allow the Supreme Court of Justice to start a process of um, modernization of the court and we need the, we needed the support to provide uh, the service with the necessary tools first we the duration of the car, judicial career is more concrete and such reform are harmonized to other laws as established parameters in order to comprehend the situation of our country and the court can perform a careful analysis on the conditions of the service provided by the justices, the competency facing the excessive work burden that is sometimes complex and judicial officials have been uh, given the uh, ability to express their willingness to keep on the, the, in their positions and we could let the people keep on exerting their position and article four of the judicial career have the stability during the time allotted by the law, the categories of the justices and justice, a judges was updated. Since some of the categories disappeared, we allowed to approve and to improve the labor situation and an equitative distribution of the resources so that they can exert their role. This was not possible before the reform since such body had a structure in the second instance magistrates and the justices of the Republic that did not respond to the reality of the jurisdictional community and it created an equality 
in the judicial headquarters. The third point was established with greater accuracy the powers of the Supreme Court in relation to the need and the complexity of the judicial courts, and they can have the knowledge and uh, these notices cannot be done. And I would like to clarify here that the power to transfer judges is not new. This power was granted by the reform of since 1990. And in practice, it was difficult to implement due to the categories of the judges. Another aspect I would like to refer to is the stigmatization of uh, several causes related to crimes of the past or other relevant cases. I would like to say that these reforms express their consent to keep on their positions. As well, for the Commission to have a clear context of the situation, we are informing that the, there was 702 judges at the time, and the measures were applicable to 120 justices. So through an agreement, it was decided to give a bonus corresponding to 24 wages to the judges that are eligible, that th those who would decide on the on their own retirement. As a result, 96 judges presented their, re their, their retirement uh, voluntarily. They, they did it voluntarily. The rest, 121 judicial officials, that is 27.2%, uh, admitted not doing this, and only five judges were laid off by law, which is 0.7% of the judges at the national nev level. And the volunteer resignations of these justices meant the need to fulfill those uh, vacant situations. So the Supreme Court of Justice, according to section two and three of article nine of the decree 124, admitted their transfer to not interrupt the exercise of justice. So they were eligible and the appropriate uh, options to fulfill these vacant positions. There were no modifications in terms of powers exerted by judicial officials, and least of all, there have been any restriction or uh, execution of external pressures. So this is with the aim of expressing a clear framework related to transfers. This should, th there should be a resolution with due cause without the waiver procedure as regards judicial, judicial officials. But also the categories established by law should be improved. And this meant uh, the improvement of the career of many judges according to their competencies. They were considered for this new appointments. This reflects that 
This has the aim to solve the different problems of the judicial system and to guarantee the access to justice for the population. Also to give meaning to the work of judicial officials by regulating their time of service, the transfer of justices and magistrates, and by establishing a just remuneration or compensation for the work. So, dear commissioners, there was a particular uh, mention to Francisco Bulnena, who had who had the massacre of El Masoque in charge. So beyond the monitoring of the Inter-American Commissions of Human Rights, of the compliance of state obligations deriving by, by the Inter-American documents, the same act that was applied gave authorization for the continuity of different judges or magistrates in their position. In that sense, the president of the Supreme Court of Justice and the commission of judges offered this judge to continue in the exercise of his functions because he was in the condition and had the competencies to do so. However, due to a personal decision, he retired in 2021. Thus, the Supreme Court of Justice was in the need to proceed with the appointment of Teresa Cutillo for that position to give continuity with the exercise of justice. Also, to provide a prompt reply to the victims, we designed a plan to allocate resources and tasks first to complete the research to uh, identify the material perpetrators of the uh, crimes. Second, to complete the research as relation in relation to the identity of all victims. And third, to create an investigation to uh, identify the accomplices to provide comprehensive reparation to the victims. Dear commissioners, the state of Salvador and particularly the Supreme Court of Justice has the clear interest to continue adopting concrete measures to guarantee the independ independence of the judicial system and to protect, to protect judges from external pressures and all other types of influence from other powers. This includes to safeguard the independence of the just judiciary to guarantee their the stability of their continuity of the judges in their in their positions and also the provision of just uh, retirement compensation this is the conclusion of my intervention i give the floor back to my colleague thank you very much good morning commissioner organizations of the civil society here today members of the representation of the state of El Salvador, let me greet you respectfully. And thank you for the opportunity. Dear commissioners, I want to continue with our the state intervention addressing a different topic related to the reform of the organic law of the office of the Attorney General of the Republic. which has to do with the transfer, promotion, and continuity in position of different justices and magistrates. This was approved in September 2018. I'm sorry, the original audio breaks up. I'm sorry, but the audio is not clear enough. We acknowledge that 
143 judges were, were appointed until 30, the 31st of December of 2021. And they were rehired. 67% of the judges of the nation were rehired as well until 2022. They were able to resign due to health conditions as well. They will face the enormous responsibility of carrying out the excesses of justice. They were in charge of uh, struggling, of fighting organized crime, crimes against women, children and adolescents, gender-based violence, among others, and also cyber attacks. We asked for the, for the ensuring of the effective protection of human rights for victims of different cases brought to the court. This has allowed for the possibility of reopening several uh, cold cases related to uh, murders, for instance. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much to the representation of the state. We have the intervention of the Inter-American Commission. First, first Vice President Eduardo Rallon, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, I greet different organizations of the civil society and the state representatives. I have one question for the civil society organizations and the states, both. In its intervention, the civil society indicated that there is uh, harassment. In fact, they used the word uh, harassment strategies, which harm the guarantee of judicial independence. So my question is, do you have, can you provide any details as to why you consider that, or where do you consider this situation comes from, or if there are any pattern that calls your attention in in regards to this uh, harassment situation, to be able to understand better what are you referencing here? And also in that same line, I would ask the state to give its opinion on the situation, on this statement uh, provided by the civil society, that is, this different strategies of harassment mentioned by the organization. Do you think this exists or this is a phenomenon that is taking place in El Salvador? What is the, the opinion of the state in that regard? And taking advantage of the presence of the Supreme Court of Justice here, what is the environment in which they uh, exercise their functions? That would be my questions. Thank you. Commissioner Joel Hernandez, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon to everyone. I also second the uh, vote of thanks for the uh, civil society organizations who have requested this hearing, but also I recognize, I acknowledge the representatives of the states for being here present today, especially through the representatives of different public uh, branches involved. This it's a topic that has called the attention of the Commission, but also the uh, it's international community, which is closely monitoring the latest developments in El Salvador. All agents or actors are concerned about the strengthening of the democracy in El Salvador. The reforms mentioned here today have been uh, reforms that have had a deep impact 
And as mentioned here, they have taken place within the context of different stigmatizing uh, speeches or discourses in social media. I am not mentioning who is the author of this. We all know with who I am referring to. I have read these messages myself, which basically stigmatize the functions of justice operators by blaming them of the several, deci several decisions they have taken during the pandemic in the exercise of their function that was um, appointed to them. So this happens in a context of high, uh, of a high division among the society. Also, I want to call the attention to the intensity of this reform related to the judicial uh, career and the general attorney's office. It's not, uh, it's not weird that 10 out of the 15 positions of the judiciary are being renewed in a single week. It's not frequent that 200 justices are removed out of a total of 700 who are members of the judicial system of the country. So all these elements also are embedded in a situation in which we have to know if decrees 144 and 145 followed constitutional mechanisms to, to be approved. This really calls our attention uh, the expeditious manner in which these degrees were adopted, actually wave, uh, with the waiver of procedure to be adopted very, very promptly. These are the ingredients to this topic and which lead us to address this in this way. What I celebrate myself is that both the representatives of the state and the requesting organizations for this hearing are pronouncing themselves in favor of judicial independence, which is also one of the goals that is sought by this Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. I believe this hearing has allowed us to uh, get to know better part of the reasoning behind the state behind the state's decisions in this in this path. But also, as was pointed out, uh, the Due Process Foundation at the beginning of this hearing, the report of the in loco visit from the commission covers the facts that took place during the visit. And our report did not cover this latest development developments during 2021. I also took down some notes of the high expectations expressed by Judge Jorge Alberto Guzman towards the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Certainly the main obligation uh, falls on the state to give answer to many of these questions. But the commission, however, is uh, forced, is obligated to act in terms of judicial independence. We want to be a reference so that the acts that take place are in accordance to the American Convention, the Inter-American in jurisprudence to have more legitimacy. So let me conclude, Madam President, by uh, providing to the state this request that was expressed by the civil society the fact that we should have a working visit as a rapporteur for the rights of uh, human rights defenders and justice operators. I am at your disposal. And I think this is a very important visit. It's a necessary visit to be able to complement this country report, but also to be able to know there in situ and firsthand the situation of in the uh, judicial independence in El Salvador. I think they will give the commission a better understanding of the situation and we will be able to be available for the state to work with the civil society and understand what is the status of the judiciary in El Salvador. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner. I will give the floor to Commissioner Vernon. 
Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank you and all the petitioners of the hearing and the, the representatives of the state to allow us the opportunity to have this sincere dialogue on one of the basic principles of democratic constitutionalism and uh, principle for the human rights respect, which is the principle of autonomous uh, independent judiciary. It has several elements, but I would like to refer to three basic elements. One of them is the perpetuatio jurisdiction, is the principle according to which when a judge starts to know of a certain matter, that judge should not be removed from that matter, from that case that warrants this independent justice because this means that cases are not ad hoc distributed to judges, but when they start treating a case, they independently can rule on that case. The second one is a principle according to which judges ha should have a clear rules of procedures from the beginning, pre-established with rules that are not changing uh, frequently, with clear ground rules, and that they allow the judge to know when, up to when they're going to be in their position and under which conditions they're going to work, etc. That's a basic principle of the independent justice principle. And there is a third one, which is not to have the intervention of other powers. I believe that the um, appointment in the appointment of the magistrates of the justices of the Supreme Court, there are some bodies, other other bodies that intervene, but just for them, for, for other judges, there should not be an intervention by the executive or the legislative. So I would like to request the state to pronounce itself on the following. If we look at Article 3 and 4 of, our, of Decree 144, which has similar items to 145, Article 3 reforms Article 4 of the bylaws of the judiciary. It says that judges will the, their appointment will terminate when people reach 60 years of age, which implies the lack of their roles or the termination of their role in their position. This principle, according to an Amaya reader, which is me at these times, is not compatible with the principle of perpetual and about the way of, according to we judges should know when is it that they're going to be working in that position under which conditions they're going to retire and which are the characteristics of the salary and social contributions of their positions. But here is article four. Nevertheless, the magistrate who has terminated their role, the Supreme Court will be able to determine the possibility that they will keep on exerting the position in accordance to uh, the especially of the matter. This is a very indeterminate criteria, and this would indicate that the principle of the clear establishment, which, which is the jurisdiction and which is the uh, jurisdiction assigned to a judge is being altered and is being affected in a supreme way. So I would request that um, the state should answer, which is your expl explanation according as to how to read these two articles with these basic contents of judicial independence. Thank you, Madam President, thank you. Even though I am country reporter, I always prefer to speak at the end first to be able to hear all the colleagues of the commission, but also not to repeat things that have already been said. So I would like to make some general comments. I believe that we are we all agree in the importance of judicial independence and the importance of 
for the warranty of democracy that is within the intra-american code obligations that on the one side and that the power to transfer justice justices cannot be denied and judges cannot be denied to the state but we need to have several standards and principles and i'm going to repeat them because i believe that we already know them Secondly, I would like to state how the Commission published a report on human rights. We had a very interesting debate in the Commission on this report, but when it comes to judicial independence and uh, the last few months were not included because it was a report referred to such visit. Along these lines, I would like to remind you of the two notices, the two press releases that the Commission uh, issued, because I believe that they summarize these concerns we are expressing here, in, especially the power to transfer justice, judges and the measures that the state can take, but also the power and how those powers have to be regulated because the state decided so when they are part of the inter-American system. And I would like to make some specific requests, reminding that if you do not have information right now, we can receive them afterwards. First, an analysis or the information that you may have on how these measures have directly affected the judges. Here it's both men and women judges, which has been the impact in their careers, in terms of retirement, in terms of uh, promotions, in terms of the privilege of a judicial career. So I, we would like to have an assessment of this type. Secondly, I would like to get to know quantifiable information. Even though we have these figures that we have included, Commissioner Hernandez had made reference to it. These, we would like to uh, have also geographic information on the type of proceedings that these judges uh, were in charge of. And I also know that these have been recent reforms and we are highly interested in which has been the impact in justice administration. Our countries, the impact to the access to justice is quite difficult and it has to do with norms, with procedures. But I would like to know which is the impact in terms of the access of, to justice of people. I'm speaking of cases such as El Mosote and others in which the victims and the representatives start a proceeding, they trust in the judiciary. And if these transfers have had an impact in confidence, in trust by these victims. And on the other hand, those uh, judges that have substituted or have replaced those justice operators, how was the process to appoint those people, new people as judges? Finally, well, Commissioner Hernandez already commented on is it, I was going to say this at the end, but uh, that possibility of having that in local visit, oh, sorry, a working visit, first a broad visit, but that will have a diverse participation in terms of justice operators and also in terms of memory, um, truth and justice. And this visit that the commission has already requested in the reports could be useful for the recovery of trust that I believe is of essence. So having said that, I would give the floor to the civil society for 12 minutes. i sorry, the executive secretary said that she had no questions. Sorry, Rapporteur Pedro Vaca. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you to the representatives of the state as well and the petitioners. We have made reference to hostile narratives, and I would like to ask 
probably to put forward in this hearing or afterwards, I would like to them to be more specific through which channels, which type of messages, when they occur, I believe that these uh, help the reporter to understand this phenomena. The, there is a deteriorated participation environment in all the region. And we, when we speak about judiciary independence, we should have, we should speak about, uh, when we speak about a hostile strategy, we are talking about something that is uh, important for judges to carry out their work and we they should be able to receive receive criticism without this criti criticism implying a censoring of independence and we are not speaking only of the contents of the message which can be critical but where from which place they are issued which is the impact and the action plan of Rabat, where there is some analysis there, but also the Inter-American um, Treaty, but we have also referred to the importance of the official voice and the social perception of the rule of law and the, and I would like to ask the state the following. The topic of the wholesale narrative against the judiciary has been put forward, which is a relation that it has in relation to what Rallon has posed. And I would also like to receive from them comment, comments on this topic and how there's a hostile narrative against justice operators. Thank you, reporter. Now I will give the floor to the civil society for 12 minutes. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to first say that the state has said that the reforms to the career law have been due to the interest of strengthening and modernizing justice. We do not doubt that there is an interest from some of the state authorities and they're part of the executive branch in the delegation of the state. And that is something that we would like to address here. Um, we also, it also strikes us that if these reforms are of aid to the need to strengthen the democracy, why no data was exposed and why the correspondence that was presented does not make reference to this need of strengthening that should be justified in objective evidence. I would also like to refer to the um, availability regime that Mr. Bernal has mentioned, the warranties apart from the stability, we need the warranty against external pressures. So it would be interesting for the state to answer how these regime offers warranties to those who are in that regime. Most of the judges, that is one more than one third of the judges have uh, subjected themselves voluntarily to that regime does not mean that that willingness annuls their independence. I mean, this is the evidence of that affectation because it will not create the mobility, but it's, it affects the warranty against um, external pressure because it's a pressure that places them in a situation where there is no security as to when they are going to exert a faction or whether they are going to be transferred and they have no stability. There are more people that have a contract that have more stability but it's important to the state to clarify which are the warranties that are recognizing the international treaties that exist in that regime. I will give the floor to my colleagues now. 
Thank you. As regards the transfer of judges and the direct effect on them, I will refer to two specific points. The first has to do with the fact that the they were removed from their charges, the judges who had uh, turned 60 years old and not all of them had uh, 30 years in service, which directly affects them because they don't have the enough enough time in service to be able to get a retirement payments. And as the state has recognized, there was also only one bonus, not a compensation to the judges who resigned. This is why we in insist on the fact that this is a co-action, co-option and not a volunteer action. There was a transfer of different judges which were in charge of cases of national extension. For instance, magistrates from the chambers of, of criminal matters of San, of El Salvador were transferred to the to the interior of the country. Also, the the judges from the chamber of the environment of Santa Teresa also were transferred. As we said, judge the the peace uh, judge was transferred, and the former Ministry of Justice and Security, which is under uh, criminal procedure right now was also appointed. Also, a judge which determined that there was no uh, causes behind the, the, the trial of a judge for her comments. There, there are many transfers of other types of judges. This is why we are speaking about the violation of the guarantee of judicial independence. And also the state of El Salvador has a direct involvement and the executive branch as well in judges who are in charge of different cases. This infringes judicial uh, independence. I give the floor to my colleague, Carrillo, Mr. Carrillo. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. I want to refer to the reply of the state of El Salvador. I think the state has uh, bypassed the, the, the merits of what we are referring here to. They have referred to the materialization of the problem we are debating here, which is the transgression of the government of El Salvador and their lack of compliance with their obligations. They have referred to uh, Decree 144, which actually was approved with a waiver of procedure, which was proposed by the ruling party's deputy members and contravening the bylaws of the Legislative Assembly, which establishes that the this can only be done in urgent cases and can have, and this urgency has to be proved. Also, the Constitution and the jurisprudence of El Salvador has pointed out that this is falls on the judiciary. So this measure that the state representatives have measures have mentioned uh, are the are the proof of this violations. And this has to do with what happened on May 2021 when the Supreme Court justices were removed. That is, that degree number 144 is being implemented by official, officials whose legitimacy is quite in question. So I would ask the representatives of the state if they consider this is a resolution that is in, in force. And actually it has been published. It is on the Supreme Court, court uh, website right now. According to this, the removal carried out by the Legislative Assembly on May does not have any effect. That is an assembly that is chaired by a former employee by 
of the president of the Republic. The deputy that contributed to this waiver procedure is the former minister of the country's president. Part of different members of the assembly are family members of the president. So under those circumstances, the decision that was taken is quite questionable and the mandate is quite clear to that respect. So in line with this, the position of the Salvadorian state has alluded referring to the fundamental problem of this hearing, which is the guarantee of the separation of powers and judicial independence in the framework of the different bodies established by the Salvadorian state. This concludes my intervention, thank you. You have almost four minutes left. Have you uh, concluded with your participation? Pardon? Sorry, yes. Hola. I wanted to reply to the request made by the commissioners especially related to where have the aggression discourses come from against different justice, justice operators and against human rights specifically this verbal attacks come from official accounts of different officials, officials from the Legislative Assembly, among them uh, members of the Cabinet or uh, officials of different uh, national bodies. And as regards specific situations of threats, to the personal integrity of different persons. After May the 1st, and in the context of recent developments related to the removal of justice operators after the reform of the Judicial Career Act, different uh, members of the armed forces and the executive branch were close to the office of, or, or the home address of Judge Duran. And let us not forget that part of the verbal attacks expressed unfortunately come from the verified official account of the Republic's president. And you can check on that as a, as a clear proof that there is aggressive discourse against those who disagree with the ruling party and those who demand judicial independence. So these are a couple of examples you can find and actually have been addressed to, as proof of this aggressive discourse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ursula, did you want to comment something? Yes, only to say that many of these uh, screenshots of tweets wrote, written by the officials of the Legislative Assembly against justice, the justice system, uh, happened before May the 1st. And this takes us to point out that this is a stage, the first stage, that justified uh, future uh, later measures. And these screenshots are included in different um, documents that are uh, at the availability of the commission already. One, there is, there is actually a very well-known uh, tweet in which president, the president said that if he was a dictator, he would um, shoot down five, five of the justices to save millions of lives blaming them on the effects of their decisions uh, in the face of the pandemic. Very gladly, we can provide that information to you. Thank you very much to the civil society. I give the floor to the state for 12 minutes. 
Thank you. I have taken down some notes of the points mentioned. I would like to refer to, refer to each of them specifically. We were asked as regards uh, the conditions of the exertion of the judicial functions, the conditions in which the different judges work are normal. The transfers, as uh, we said before, have always been a power from the Supreme Court of Justice. And there are two types of transfers, those who happen uh, temporarily, those who are permanent. So that you can understand the situation, I want to uh, inform to you that there are many vacant positions for judges in the system. So there is a need that stems from that to cover those spaces temporarily while we carry out a process to select the judges. Of course, this is not only competency from the Supreme Court of Justice, but actually there is an interaction with the ministry. So until these spots are, are filled, we carry out temporary transfers. Of course, for the for the different members of the judicial system, this means that there is a transfer of judges or magistrates who are a main member so that they take this type of positions. This is an ordinary mechanism. And also I want to refer to temporary uh, transfers, which take place when magistrates or judges are absent, legally absent, given a legal reasoning, for instance, a paid uh, um, sick leave or, or something else. So this is a daily dynamics that we follow. And I refer specifically to the General Secretariat of the Supreme Court of Justice. And there are transfers who are not ordered by the Supreme Court of Justice, but rather sometimes they are requested by the judicial officials themselves who want to uh, exert their new competencies in terms of, uh, in relation to the training processes they have followed. Let's see what else. Something else that is very important to mention is the opening that the open position against judicial officers right now is that they are allowed to participate in the institutional strategic plan, which includes different policies as regards how the Supreme Court of Justice will be using uh, different measures to make its, its competences, its powers more effective. So judicial officials have the ability to participate in the decisions to improve judicial mechanisms. Another point has to do with the change of jurisdiction for judges. Well, this point could be interpreted differently because as I said before, all judges receive uh, training by, by the state. It's part of our, of our body and we are creating a technical profile for each of the ju judges so that they can be promoted within their own judicial career. And this allows them for the possibility to improve in their career, not only in specific matters, but also in as 
something that is the right. So those transfers could uh, have an impact on the right of these justices. As regards Article 3, which was not in line with a different regulation, well, I think there is no possibility to interpret this article in this way because voluntarily the judges can request the court to continue exert, uh, exercising his functions and the obligation of the court is to provide reasons so that the court can, so that the judge can continue in his position. And in relation with the regime of availability, I would like to, to, to say something specific. As a natural process for all persons who reach a certain age, we may have some problems that imply that you lose some qualities for your work. And so by losing these skills, this could lead to a problem, to an impact on, on the system. So with this regime, we allow for the possibility of judges who reach a certain age to be monitored by the Supreme Court of Justice. So from there stems the decision to strengthen the judicial system itself so that it's not affected, so that we can guarantee that access to justice is efficient. And what else? Other aspects that I had uh, noted down? Well, I will conclude here my intervention to uh, give space to the rest of my colleagues to address some other topics. Thank you, commissioners. I believe that the questions are interesting. I will answer them now. You said in your intervention that there was a de-articulation of certain uh, clear actions and certain organizations, social organizations. That is false. There was a category in the in this investigation. We used to have the anti-corruption unit. Now we have a office for organized crime and corruption together. And we have now a directorate against corruption and one against organized crime. So there are different resources allocated and staff allocated to treat these cases. And I will give some data that the president requested. I would also like to refer to Mr. Commissioner talked about the independence 144 and I equal it to decree 145. Mobility of the judges is dynamic. The nature of the work cannot, cannot be concentrated in one single unit for a long time. It is too uh, exhausting due to the conditions and the crimes we have right now. There are studies, scientific studies and medical studies that state that attorneys should rotate every six years within a general attorney's office. 
And in terms of these, it was for some of these uh, colleagues that have over 60 years of age, I am not going to refer to the experience of them, but also to the medical studies. This has to do with medical studies within the institution because of the exhaustion, even at the medical level, prosecutors are the ones that mostly have degenerative uh, diseases and this can be corroborated by studies. I would also like to um, give some data on the impact in the administration of justice. And this has an impact in the court. How many cases have started since May 2020 until May 2021? And I then, I will compare it both month. The amount of cases started 47,000. When an attorney was designated with 65,000 people, judiciary cases brought to court 14,000 and the cases afterwards, 16,000. With the new attorney office, 8,000. With the previous one, 6,000. The cases with a ruling, 4,000. And in the new one, 6,000. And this was, this creates more trust in the judiciary. Thank you. The time is up and we are reaching the end of this hearing. I would like to reiterate my gratitude uh, first to the representatives of the civil society. As I always say, this is a typical phrase, not only because of being here, but because of your constant everyday work of monitoring that help us with the reports and help especially the commission. I would also like to thank the uh, representation of the state, the commission, and this president really values your president today. We have taken down notes of you, what you have said, and I also thought I was a reporter until last year for the rights of the elderly and El Salvador is one of the one who ratified the Inter-American Commission for the Protection of the Elderly. So it is interesting that when we speaking about trans transfers, this is important, the intersectionality that is being taken into consideration and not discrimination because of age. The commission is at your disposal. We took the notes of the request of the civil society uh, the request for the visit, the request for precautionary measures, and we also would like to thank the state that we believe is going to send this information in writing. If there is something that our countries have in common and the people in our countries is a sick for justice. As a reporter for memory, truth and justice, I would like to refer to the El Mosote cases and the judges of uh, Argentina and Chile. People keep on resorting to justice after 10 or 20 years. And when we ask why, it's because they trust justice, the judiciary. That is why it's really important and we are really concerned. The inter-American system is concerned on this topic. Along these lines, the commission, uh, apart from thanking you, would like to, would, would like you to keep on having this dialogues with the civil society we have already had them and with the state with of exchange of giving the reports it's not about judging about it's about assessing monitoring and give recommendations in our last report we have a series of recommendations that include a visit of the special rapporteurship i know that 
Mr. Pedro Baca is at your disposal to do this work in visit, which is not a visit of surveillance. It's just a visit, a working visit, so as to be able to consolidate what I said at the beginning of my intervention, trust. Because if we lose trust, if we lose confidence, we lose everything. And it's not about the people who are here in the hearing, but it's about the uh, citizenship at large. I would like to um, uh, keep on with this dialogue and I hope to have these in exchanges again. The hearing is closed. I thank everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you.